This video is sponsored by Raycon. If you want to listen to my soothing sexy accent in these slick, comfortable wireless earbuds, stick around until the end of the video to hear all about these bad boys. Watching Wreck is like having a relentless panic attack. It petrifies you to your very core as breathing becomes near impossible and your heart screams to get out of you. It's the purest realistic scenario. Late one night you wake up to find everything around you has spiralled into utterly confused chaos. But we're not talking about a disaster or an apocalypse or something that the whole world can unite in. No, this is chaos chaos that is isolated solely to you, and made more terrifying by the fact that the rest of the world continues to sleep peacefully while you struggle to comprehend a situation that you never thought you would find yourself in. We see this on the news on a regular basis, sudden spontaneous tragedies that make us grateful for our safety and ignite our compassion for how turbulent living can simply be. It's a believable setup. On the surface, the residents of an apartment complex in Barcelona are forced into quarantine after the suspected outbreak of an unknown infection, leading to outbursts of anger, hysteria and bewilderment as the occupants become increasingly resistant to being trapped in a place they once considered their home. Wreck has a substantially influential reputation in the found footage subgenre for not only being considered one of the true modern rejuvenations of horror in the 21st century, but it has even been argued by many outlets and critics to be up there as one of, if not the scariest found footage horror ever made. So let's see for ourselves. Muy buenas noches, les habla Angela Vidal. Hoy Bluntly speaking, Wreck is the very definition of intense. Once it gets going, it grabs you by the balls and doesn't let go until the camera stops recording. I like to think of it as taking the apartment staircase sequence from 28 Days Later and turning it into a very literal self-contained, tightly focused feature film that moves in one clear direction. The film is barely 80 minutes long, and so when shit goes from 0 to 1000 in mere seconds, it makes it impossible to predict what's going to happen around the next corner, and almost never gives you a moment to relax and recollect your thoughts. The environment is actually the star of the show, because the use of cramped and narrow corridors, a very limited repetitive series of rooms, and a single winding staircase heightens the claustrophobia to a downright oppressive level. In many respects, it is technically a zombie movie, but there are a few surprises I won't spoil until later in the video, but I'll warn you when we get to it. By the way, there are three sequels that I won't be covering because I just do not think they're worth your time, as they squander the original film's provocative and ambiguous storytelling by, well, removing everything that's provocative and ambiguous about it. Before the chaos commences, we follow a reporter called Angela and her cameraman Pablo as they produce a documentary show about life in late night Barcelona, where in this particular episode they're shadowing the shenanigans of the local fire department. This scene, along with another later one, highlights how Wreck strongly compounds its sense of authenticity in the most remarkably nuanced ways. 
None of the characters have unique personality traits or distinguish themselves in traditionally archetypical ways. They just react naturally to their levels of comfort like any one of us. For example, there's a clear sense of reluctance and awkwardness when they're being interviewed or acknowledging the existence of the camera because they're simply not used to it. They're not born performers or skilled presenters. They switch on their professional interview persona when necessary, but the the film makes sure to show us the inherent unnaturalness of the process, even when it comes to Angela who switches from presenter mode to just her plain, ordinary, naturally insecure self, helped by the fact that the actress is actually a TV presenter in real life. Again, these are really nuanced details, but they highlight a certain level of necessary precision when it comes to making found footage feel real. Typically, find footage is treated as a super easy gimmick to pull off, because it really is as simple as holding a camera, throwing in a few spontaneous off-screen surprises, and having the actors act uncontrollably dramatic about nothing. But you can tell the difference between a thoughtful one and a cheap one. Now, admittedly, every fine footage film has the exact same problem of why are you still filming when your life is clearly in danger, but that's forgivable, otherwise you don't have a movie to watch, so that nitpick's redundant, yet it's pointed out all the time for some reason, I just don't get people. But I think the major difference between a good fine footage flick and a bad one is purely down to consistency. It's common for bad ones to unintentionally give away their artifice by going from natural handheld camera work that's sometimes deliberately shaky to maintain the illusion to shots that are just too well predictably composed for an emotionally intense scenario. And that's not mentioning how many of them cheat these days with multicam and literally just forgetting it's a found footage movie. What made Cloverfield's handling of the genre in a blockbuster setting so brilliant, for example, was that the framing was consistently clear that you could say the character just had a good eye with the camera, which is a natural trait for some people, and it is specifically established in that film to be something that the character does end up having a lot of fun with before disaster strikes. In The Blair Witch, on the other hand, the inconsistency plays into their inexperience as film students trying to capture good shots while also being easily distracted and increasingly impatient and distressed as their situation gets worse. In this case, the camera work actually becomes an emotional component to the story. In Wreck, Pablo is a trained cameraman. He knows what he's doing, and even when the situation gets crazy, God love him, he does his best to do his job right. He's an inspiration to every underpaid camera person out there who will go out of their way to get the best shot possible. However, I want to call attention to an even finer detail that I'm pretty sure no other fine footage film has ever done before. Almost all the characters frequently look into the lens of the camera. Like I said regarding the performances being awkward and somewhat unnatural when acknowledging the existence of a camera, it makes sense for the actors to ignore the rules they've been trained to follow so that they're behaving as humanistically as possible. From a cinematic perspective, it's not natural to look at the camera, and unless the character is meant to directly address it, they typically either look at the person holding it or off frame because the actor is being coached by the director. Actor. But it's actually more natural for people to look at the camera. You've probably heard something like this before, but there is a psychological effect to being subconsciously attracted to a camera pointing at you. Hell, it's a common direction given to people being interviewed to not address the camera, let alone something actors are taught never to do. And all of this goes along with characters frequently talking over each other so that it never feels like any of them are delivering lines from a script. In fact, a large part of it is improvised. But reacting impulsively and even incoherently to situation as they see it. I know it's such a strange detail to get caught up on, but trust me, it goes a long way to building its realism and perpetuating the qualities that fine footage films ought to have to be taken seriously. But let's talk about the scary shit. 
y le traía antibióticos a la silla. What I think truly benefits Rec is that it respects the audience time and does not rely on elaborate trickery to pull off scares or surprises. For example, this fall scene is made powerful by not only avoiding conventional framing as to not call attention to itself, but it lacks setup or prior tension. It feels real and spontaneous, and because none of the actors apparently knew it was going to happen, the reactions are a lot more genuine. More so, when a scene is completely dark, that's because it is. The actors literally do not know where they're going, so it creates a lot of organic tension and discomfort. But it's the film's short runtime that also works greatly to its advantage. As I said earlier, it means that the chaos escalates at an uncontrollable and unpredictable rate, but it also means that plot details about the infection are delivered frequently enough to keep your interest rising. The story more or less suggests that the infection is a form of rabies spread by a dog within the apartment complex, but it's the air of uncertainty surrounding its origins that makes the residents increasingly paranoid and any symptom of illness is rightfully taken as a sign of infection. The film isn't even afraid to make children violent victims to the infection as well. All bets are very quickly off the table, as outside Angela and Pablo, there aren't any support characters with plot armor, as I find myself kinda surprised at who ended up infected so early on. However, taking a page from the Blair Witch Project, it's the film's final 10 minutes that truly solidify Wreck as an all-time great, because it is both arse-tighteningly scary that my words will not do it justice, and it completely flips such a conventional zombie story on its head. So spoilers. So, after basically every supporting character transforms into a rabid zombie, Angela and Pablo hide in the top floor penthouse, where they discover the real cause of the infection. Now, what gives this revelation significantly more effect is that it's actually heavily foreshadowed throughout the film, impassable comments and observations made by the residents. The gist of the infection is this. A Portuguese woman called Tristina was believed by the Vatican to have symptoms of demonic possession, and the penthouse owner was tasked with finding an enzyme, but it quickly mutated and became contagious, and ultimately spread throughout the apartment complex. So, in a way, the zombies are technically people possessed by an evil demonic enzyme. That's right, it's a demon spread via infection. In fact, when you think about it, Rack is a pretty bizarre hybrid of horror subgenres that had immense popularity throughout the 21st century. Put it this way, it's a fine footage flick about a zombie outbreak caused by a demonic possession. Seriously, in the hands of Hollywood, that sounds like a Frankenstein's mess of pandering to every trend imaginable. But here, it actually works because thankfully it doesn't try to make it any more contrived than that. The way I say it makes it sound ridiculous, but in the context of an ambiguous story carried by strong filmmaking prowess, it gives you just enough interesting material to think about without completely falling on its ass. Like I said earlier, I do think the sequels hinder the mystery of the first film, more so in regards to how it ends, but to be fair, the explanation in the sequels is fine, it's just not necessary or add anything to make it even slightly more compelling. In fact, by ruining the mystique, it exposes it as just another average demonic possession story. Without the context of Tristina, all we know is that she mutated into whatever the hell this thing is, that simply leaving us with this image of some unknown eldritch demon thing is far more powerful than any explanation could ever give us. Seeing Angela dragged away into the darkness is a profoundly haunting way to end such a sudden, jarring revelation where, by breaking into this penthouse, they've inadvertently released this creature from what seems to be a room designed to suppress her evil. I mean, the marketing kinda spoils it because it is the film's most iconic bankable moment, but when you take it along with the context of everything the characters went through, it really does leave you, as I said in the beginning, kind of breathless. 
Now, just to address it, because I know people will ask, John Eric Dowdle, the director of the play Kipsy Tapes, did produce an American remake called Quarantine that released just less than a year after the original. It's actually kind of decent in its own right, but it's basically identical that if it weren't for the fact it was a found footage film, it would practically be shot for shot. The only main difference is that Tristina is replaced with something credited as simply Thin Infected Man played by Doug Jones because of course it is, and the explanation is condensed down to a terrorist cult who unleashed a biochemical weapon because I assume the demonic stuff is just too tempting a setup for a sequel, not that that stopped Hollywood from making a sequel, that quickly went straight to DVD anyway. In short, Wreck is a grand example of less being more. It benefits from the use of found footage to capture an intimate first person narrative about being trapped in a place that feels increasingly smaller and smaller as the danger escalates. Its scares are reinforced by being virtually inescapable. In a way, it puts time into perspective, by emphasising just how quickly things get worse the longer we wait. Under quarantine, time can feel like it stands still. But in reality, the world just keeps moving faster and faster, and before you know it, it's all over in the blink of an eye. If you enjoyed this video and want to listen to future content from me in the most affordable, non-intrusive way possible, then I once again highly recommend Raycon's lightweight, brilliantly sounding, everyday E25 earbuds. Whether it be at the gym, listening to music, playing video games, or ratcheting up the tension to your favourite horror flick, these little monsters are a wonderful alternative to evil hazardous wires and heavy bear traps like this, as they sit perfectly in my awkward wonky ears thanks to the inclusion of various different bud sizes. With the ability to wirelessly charge up to four times on a single charge in this cute little case, the everyday E25 earbuds also have six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a nice solid non-intrusive design that gives you a comfortable noise isolating fit to block out the world falling apart around you. Raycon earbuds start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market, and sound just as awesome as any other top audio brand you know. Raycons make a great holiday gift for anyone this season, and because they're feeling generous for the holidays, they're offering all my viewers 15% off right now so you can save big on gift shopping. So go to buyraycon.com slash Ryan by clicking the link in the description box below to get 15% off your order, and until next time, stay safe during this Christmas season, and I'll see you all next time.